the micro. Oh, yeah. okay. So welcome to the second part of the vector section this afternoon. We have uh, very uh, interesting but also different topics uh, in this part, uh, dealing with the identification of vectors and vector surveillance, the xylem transmission properties by Philenus, uh, the xylella transmission properties by Philenus plumarius behavioral aspects and all the host plant affiliation of uh, different xylem feeding uh, insects. So we have six talks, four are uh, of 15 minutes and two with 10 minutes. So I uh, like to ask all speakers to stay in time uh, to leave time for the discussion. And the first speaker I would like to invite is Daniele Cornara from uh, the Institute of Sustainable Agriculture in uh, Spain. The title of his talk is Insights into the Transmission Dynamics of Xylella fastidiosa by Philenus Spomarius. Please, Daniele. Hello. Hello. That's nice. Uh, are we good? How it works? Forward and back. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have a pointer. No, no, it's okay. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Nice for introducing me. Thanks, Mikhail. And I'm going to present you my work about transmission dynamic of Zylella fastidiosa by Philanus Pomarius. We are all interested in. So, Zylella is a nice stuff, but without a vector, Zylella is no mean to exist. So, and here I present you a short summary of what we know about the Zalela fastidiosa transmission by its vectors. So, it's pretty much a lot of information, but still, we have two big, big questions that remain unanswered. How Zalela is transmitted by its vectors? So, what the vector does to inoculate the bacterium and to acquire the bacterium? We actually don't know this. And it's more or less 50 years that these researchers from all over the world are looking at this mechanism. And then, another question. Does Zylella manipulate its vector? Does Zylella cause an, uh, an effect on its vector? And we try to answer this question by doing transmission tests following in real time the behavior of the vector. And we can follow in real time the behavior of like Philanus pumarius by the EPG. EPG, electrical penetration graph, is a tool by which we make the insect and the plant part of an electrical circuit, and then biopotentials and electrical resistances transform the constantly applied electrical input in a variable voltage output that is graphed in waveform. In a simple way, these are the waveform, and each one of these waveform has a precise biological meaning, and this is a step of the probe. So, first of all, as we showed you in uh, Mallorca, we characterized the feeding behavior of Philanus pomarius on mainly olive. And we found that um, there are, during the probe, six stereotypically repeated behaviors. So during most of the probe, Philanus does six things. First of all, let's start from that NP, that is non-probing. It's like, like a, a flat line, so the stylets are out of the plant. Then Philanus start to penetrate the plant, is like uh, the waveform C. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a pointer. And then Philanus reaches a xylem vessel, and there is a, the xylem contact behavior, during which maybe Philanus sense if the host is suitable or not. And then if it is suitable, Philanus start a xylem ingestion. And then alternate that XI with R, that means resting. It's a flat line, so the stylets are inside the plant and Philanus is basically motionless, doing nothing. And during this xylem activity, Philanus perform also an M interruption that whose biological meaning is still unknown. So these are the six behavior that Philanus does in most of the probes, so the stereotypically repeated ones. But 
Anna Markeiser, in a study conducted in uh, Alberto Ferrer's lab, our lab in Madrid, discovered that sometimes on some hosts, especially unsuitable hosts as Oleander, Philanos does this weird behavior, this what we call spikelet burst behavior or XE waveform. And again, most, more frequently on unsuitable hosts as Oleander plant compared to grapevine or to olive. So, and other researcher associated this spikelet burst behavior to a very quick movement of the presa ibarial valve. So, this is kind of a rare behavior compared to the six stereotypically repeated behavior done in most of the probes. But, again, which one is the behavior associated with acquisition of xylella cells? Which one is in associated with inoculation? First of all, we have done an acquisition experiment. So we connected to the EPG, healthy filanus, given access to uh, an infected plant. And we either stopped the probe of filanus during like the waveform C, that means exploration of the plant before a xylem vessel, then xylem contact, the first contact with the xylem vessel, or we given Philanus access to the plant for an hour or three hours. And here are results. No acquisition before the xylem vessel, no acquisition during the first contact with a xylem vessel. One acquisition during the one hour acquisition access period, and during this, these Philanus that acquired Zalella perform like a 15 minute long xylem ingestion with 12 interruptions and a short resting behavior. And then one acquisition in the three hour acquisition access period with two hours of xylem ingestion. So keep this in mind, I'm going to discuss the results later on. For the inoculation, we tested both olive and oleander because as I told you, uh, on oleander, Philanus does more frequently than in olive that spikelet burst behavior. So in olive, we connected infective Philanus to a healthy plant and we either the um, the waveform interruption experiment, so we interrupted the probe during this six stereotypically repeated partner. None of the philanos in this experiment did the spikelet burst behavior, or we give an access to the plant for an hour or three hours. While on Oleander, we did just the waveform interruption experiment, unfortunately we had also philanos doing this spikelet burst, so we had the chance to stop the behavior during the occurrence of the spikelet burst behavior. And here are the results. This is Olive. None of the filanos we tested did during the waveform interruption experiment the spikelet bars, but we got no inoculation with none of the stereotypically repeated pattern. So what filanos does during most of the, pro the probe did not lead to inoculation of Zarella fastidiosa into the plant. For the one hour inoculation access period experiment, we got two inoculation with the only two filanos that performed the spikelet bars behavior. For the three hour inoculation, we got three inoculation, and these three were three of the only five pilenos that perform the spikelet bars behavior. And these results are consistent with the oleander. In oleander, as I told you, we had the chance also to stop the probe during the spikelet burst. And we had no inoculation with other behaviors but the spikelet burst. Five pilenos performed the spikelet bars. In three cases, we got inoculation. And another thing that surprised us, so second question, does Zylella has an effect on its vector? So what we did is simple experiment, just we did EPG of negative Philanus and Philanus infected with Zylella on healthy olive plants. And these are results. Yeah, there is a difference between negative Philanus and Philanus with Zylella. There is an effect of Zylella on its vector. This is statistically a significant difference um, so, Philanus infective with Zylella perform longer non-probing behavior. It means pro non-probe the plant for a longer time. So, it is with the stylet out of the plant for a longer time. And when probing the plant, feed less than a negative Philanus. So, perform shorter xylem ingestion and fewer xylem ingestions. And this, the discussion of my results. Acquisition. Just two Philanos acquired Zalella is determined by qPCR, but there is an interesting indication. We got acquisition with just 15 minutes xylem ingestion. Xylem ingestion or um, behavior um, interspersed with xylem ingestion are associated with acquisition of and binding of Zalella fastidiosa into the vector forget. 
For the inoculation, as I told you, this spikelet bar's behavior maybe means very quick movement of the presibarial valve. Usually it's performed by the insect in very early in the probe, from two to seven minutes from the beginning of the probe, and it's performed more often on an unsuitable host as oleander. So just merging all this data, we concluded that this behavior is something that maybe is a gestion because of Philanus arrive, probe the plant, arrive to a xylem vessel, start to sense the xylem sap during the xylem contact, and then in absence of the right stimuli, because this behavior is performed more often on an unsuitable plant, adjust, move very quickly the presibarial pulvi, and then inoculate xylem into the plants. And then the third interesting stuff is this. Philanus infected with Xylella behave from a feeding behavior point of view differently from a negative Philanus. Is this a case of true manipulation? Is this not? Does Xylella manipulate this vector to increase the transmission efficiency? We actually don't know. Our experiment opened a lot of research questions that we will try to answer from January 2020. So our group, CSIC, with University of Berkeley and EPSP CNR got founded with a Marie Curie um, program. And so we are trying to explore deeply this interaction and hopefully we will come to you with interesting stuff, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> and in the end, I would like to thank all the people that permitted me to do this. So my group in, uh, in Madrid, so Alberto Ferreras and Arancha Moreno group, and all my, like, my lab colleagues that are like my second family, and also Akli Rakale, we did all the experiment in uh, Akli Rakale facilities. And we thank also people collaborating with us that helped us a lot during the experiment. So the CNR group of Maria Saponari and Enza Don Giovanni, uh, Francesco Palmisano from the CRSFA in Locorotondo. And I would like to end thanking the two most important collaborator of both the project, Ponte and X Factor that are Marina and Flash, the dogs of Cooperativa Cliracale facilities. And obviously, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniela, for this interesting talk. And we have time for questions. Daniel, the, this uh, uh, funny waveform that you found, this, this, the spikes, uh, was in the pathway phase or in the xylem phase no. of the penetration? No, uh, maybe I was not clear. It's like mm, during the pathway, after the pathway, there is the xylem contact. After the xylem contact, either mm, like Philanus begin like a resting behavior, like a flat line, and the spikelet or just the spikelet and stop. So for this, our explanation of arrive, then sense the xylem, and in absence of the right stimuli or something else, because of oleander is very toxic, perform this spikelet bust. But it was in the xylem already? Yeah, in the xylem, yeah, sure. And uh, another question about the preparation of the, the infective insects uh, that you tested for behavior, the change. Uh, how were they prepared? They, you allowed them to feed for a long period of time on infected plants and you tested? Yes, all the filanas were put on a infected olive for 10 days. That's the problem of working with olive because of very low acquisition efficiencies, like 10 days in perfect condition for them. And then, uh, so we used also negative filanas were put on the, on the olive plants and then screened on periwinkle plant to be sure they were positive or negative and so on, and then the EPG, because we wanted to work in the same experimental condition for all the individuals. Okay, yeah, because it could be either a, a direct effect, maybe because of this long time, uh, the bacteria could grow and form a dense biofilm, like 10 days, or it could be also some effects from the pre-exposure to um, Sicky plant, I don't know. Uh, it's so you you are meaning the kind of manipulation yeah, effect. Yeah. We have other data. 
uh, but we quantified also the population of Zalela inside the vector. And what is very surprising is that we got this effect like in two parts. Either when there, are, there is a low population of Zalela or when there is a big population. So it's like, I don't know if it is something that is biological because of, you know, chitinase and interaction with fibril proteins and so on. I don't know. Or just mechanical stuff. For this, we have to explore more and to test other species like sharpshooters, for example. In Berkeley. In Ber <laughs> wait in Berkeley. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, the Congratulations for the work. There's another question there. Um, I was curious about the system. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, just some technical answers. Is it the system based on reference electrode and uh, working electrode into the soil? Yeah. How is it made up? So it's, is it possible that some variables can affect the, um, the output, like the the dryness or the wetness of a the touching, the a humidity. A lot of factor can yeah. affect this. For this, you should be like dryness of the soil. So you have an electrode connected to the insect and one in the soil, and you make the electrical circuit. And then you have to be to give the same amount of water to the soil, use the same kind of soil, working in the same condition. Otherwise, you have an output that you have to discard. And usually, you discard a lot of output because of you are not sure of what you're having. And once the insect is infected, is there any evidence of some kind of vomiting stuff, like something like regurgitating regurgi stuff or more production of saliva that could induce a l more output of the system? Because of it's quite, the amplitude is really high. Yeah, it's like everything that the insect does has its own signal, like production of saliva, penetration of the stalactite as his own signal, ingestion as his own signal. So um, I did not present this data, but like in the work of PLUS ONE that we published in 2008, there is the explanation because we did correlation test, real-time observation by video, scanning electron microscopy, and a lot of stuff to correlate. But in EPG, each single behavior of the insect give you a waveform. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we should uh, stop here. Thank you again, Daniela. <laughs> the next speaker is Jean-Claude Streitho from INRA, France. Uh, he is speaking about a barcode database to identify the vectors of Xylella fastidiosa in Europe. Um, Sorry, the pointer is still not working, but they are looking for batteries, so I hope it will. This is a Hello, uh, good afternoon. My talk will be today about uh, barcoding of vectors of Glidella. And the first point I would like to, to focus on is why it is interesting to, to do barcode of vectors of Glidella. First, because uh, vectors are very diversified, we have listed 120 species. It is a lot of species that can be vectors. And for an overview of uh, Xylella vectors, I invite you uh, to see the poster of my colleague, uh, Mr. Wilson. The second point is that the main vectors of Xylella must be identified only by dissection. If you have female, for example, it's very difficult to, to get the species. And you can see on the first line that uh, the Philinus specimen are all the same, but the genitalia, the Edeagus on the second line are quite different. So it's possible to identify them without any problem. It is a Nearly no problem. It is uh, reliable, but in fact, it is really time consuming. And if you want to do massive analysis, it's not possible to do that. For example, this is a study we did for a poster for taxonomical research. It's not possible to do this kind of work every day to, to massive and uh, routinely an analysis. And the last point is that the taxonomy of vectors of Xylella 
is not 100% satisfactory. We have a lot of problems. I will show some of them. And so barcoding is known to be an adequate method to check uh, for taxonomic health problems such as uh, cryptic species or also synonymy. It's not enough to solve the problem, but you can see them. And so it is why we started to, to barcode vectors of xylella uh, when the disease was discovered in Corsica in 2015. So how to produce these barcodes? Our main concern is to avoid misidentification that are the, the rule in international database. This is a problem. And so we, we want to provide reliable sequences. And for that, we use a complicated protocol. I will not detail everything on that, but I will point of some important uh, step. The first step is the identification of the insects by a taxonomist. After the extraction of DNA is really important and we use a non-destructive uh, extraction of DNA. Why? Because we want to be able to see again the specimen in case of problem and we will see at the end of the process that we have a lot of problem. And so for each sequence we have a specimen that is stored in collection and then can be uh, examined again, including genitalia structures that are not destroyed and that are really good uh, can be really reliable um, observed after uh, um, extraction. We choose to the study the standard barcode as defined by Herbert in 2003. And we use two different methods to produce our barcodes. First, we begin by a classical method, one PCR, and after a sequencing by a Sanger method. And after we change for a shipper method, uh, that is a double step PCR and a MySeq sequencing. There is a lot of advantage with this method. And uh, if you want more information about the method and uh, the output, you can uh, read uh, this publication of my colleagues. And I, I can answer a question also after, uh, after my talk and uh, in the poster session. Uh, Another point important is to get a pipeline. We have a pipeline to, uh, to check and to, to suppress all problems, such as sequences that are not uh, coding, contaminants, but also numps, pseudogene, etc. There is a lot of reason to have wrong sequences when you do barcoding. And the last one is that we release our sequences only when we get a consistency between the morphological identification and the molecular identification. And usually it is not the case, so we have to go again to see the specimen and so on until we, we understand what happened. This is the first part of our work. We, we did a lot of sequences and after we did also a lot of pictures to help for the identification. We did the, the pictures of genitalia, habitus, and so on, and we put them in uh, our database, name Artemis, we have the address here, and all the pictures we did and all the sequences we have validated are present and freely available on this uh, database. Uh, this is, uh, so the results now. Uh, we begin by sampling a lot of vectors and to date we have in our collection 22,000 specimens of vectors, mainly Philaenus pumarius, but also uh, Cercopides and so on. Uh, we have uh, European vectors, but also non-European vectors, especially because we worked a long time ago, no, not a long time, but a few years ago, about the Cubank project uh, which aims was to sequence all quarantine pests for Europe and non-European vectors of Xilla are of quarantine for Europe. So this is our results. We succeed to sequence 21 species of vectors of Xilla, putative vectors that represent 230 and um, 34 sequences of barcode. The number in brackets 
are the species and the sequence that are in progress. We do not validate it for the moment, but we hope to do it uh, soon. For non-European vectors, we have 23 species and uh, nearly 200 uh, sequences of uh, barcode. And we did uh, 271 uh, pictures for 24 European species and five non-European species. I will detail a little bit for some genus, so for some important genus. The most important genus for uh, Xylella vectors is Philaenus, of course, because we have inside Philaenus pumarius, that is the main vector in Italy, and also Philaenus italocygnus. Uh, we are lucky with the genus because we, we succeed to sequence five of the seven species present in Europe. That is a good performance. And uh, more, we have some few sequences that are of good quality and uh, correctly identified in international database. It is not the case, uh, usually it is not the case, so we are happy for this genus. And uh, at, the, at the end, we have all the European species that has been sequenced. This is uh, an extract of my tree about Xylella vectors. We can see that all the, the species can be identified reliably, reliably uh, with CO1, except two of them, but important uh, of them, Spumarius and Tesselatus. Oh, if I uh, focus on Tesselatus, you can see that both species are mixed and they have exactly the same uh, sequence for the co -1. Morphologically, we have exactly the same problem than uh, molecularly. This is uh, the Edagus of the species we, we had in, in my lab. This is the Edagus of Spumarius and Tesselatus. They, are, they seem to be different, but sometimes you have some uh, streaky specimens that are not easy to, to assign to one or one another. And so the, the question is, in fact, is Tesselatus a good species or not? And we have a very good uh, poster. Uh, I invite you to go and see uh, from my colleague from Portugal on this question. The second genus, I will be very quick because uh, we don't have a lot of sequences and so we don't understand uh, what's happened. But Neophilinus is a difficult genus, morphologically and also molecularly, we don't know because we have only two species sequenced to date and we need more specimen and more barcode. It is the same case for Afrophora. We have seven species in Europe we have a lot of taxonomic problems. Uh, it's not easy to identify them, even with uh, Edeagus. So we are waiting more information. The, detail, uh, the sequence present in the international database are full of mistakes of identification, and it's very difficult to, to do something with that genus. For Lepironia coleoptata, there is no problem. It is easy to, to identify morphologically and molecularly. Hopla. The, the genus, the family Cercopidae is really interesting for us because it's very easy, both morphologically and molecularly, it's very easy to identify Cercopids. We have seven species in Europe, we sequence five of them. There is a lot of misidentification, there is a few sequences in international database and they are all misidentified. This is the tree we obtain with this genus, there is no problem, all the species can be uh, reliably identified. We only have two species that are not in our um, database. Cercopis sabodiana, known by only one specimen female preserved in British Museum. And the question is, uh, what is uh, this species that uh, was not found again since 100 years? And we don't have also Tercforella, that is a, a Greek uh, species. For Cicadelidae, there is no problem for the moment, so I will pass very quickly. More interesting are Cicadidae. Cicadidae is the most diverse group of vectors present in Europe. We have 79 species for Europe, most of them localized. 
a very complicated group morphologically and taxonomically. We have very few sequences of them because they are difficult to collect and difficult to catch. And uh, to date, we have only one species uh, that is identified, uh, that is sequenced. So uh, I can say uh, nothing about uh, barcoding. In international database, we have one more species. But we are working hard to, to progress on this group. And I have about 10 species that have been sequenced and that we are um, studied at the moment. So we need more specimens, we need more sequence, but we anticipate that we will have a lot of problems because it's a, a complicated group. And we presume that uh, CO1 will be not enough to solve the problem we will, uh, we will have. So in conclusion, oh, what's happened? So in conclusion, we succeed to sequence about 405% of European vectors of uh, putative or European vectors of Zizelela, if we exclude cicadids, and if we take also the ongoing sequence that are, uh, if they are valid and if we can use them, we will reach about 60%. Uh, standard barcode is a good marker to identify uh, Zizelela vectors. Uh, about 80% of the species tested are reliably identified with this marker. What is important is that we sequence about 60% of the vectors, but the main vectors present in cropping system are already sequenced without any problem. So this gene can be used routinely now for at least the northern part of Europe. And, but some taxonomic problems remains, and the main one is this one, is the, the problem of Spumarius tessellatus and Spumarius, um, Spumari, um, and Philaenus Spumarius. What is an important problem? Because this is uh, the main vectors of Xylella, probably both are vectors of Xylella. And uh, at the beginning, we think it was localized in Portugal and Spain on a small area, and in fact, it is widely distributed, and real, uh, Tesselatus is distributed widely in Spain, Portugal, and all North Africa. It is a main species probably in this part, and as you see in the risk map, uh, this is uh, the main zone uh, with uh, Xylella risk. So it's really important to, to solve this question for, for these uh, countries. And another point is, uh, are cicadids vectors of Xylella or not? It is important because we have a lot of species. They are really abundant, and they feed on a lot of crops and trees, especially olive trees, but almond trees, vineyard, and so on. And if they are good vectors, we will have probably uh, a lot of problems. So I have finished. Thank you for your attention. A question from Daniele. Uh, yeah. uh, it's not a question, it's a reply to your question. Uh, cicadas are now vector of Zalella. So we tested it on olive and we tested also American species, and it's going to be published hopefully in one, two weeks on Entomologia Generalis. So they are definitely not vectors? No, not. Definitely, because in, you cannot say it's absolutely true, but we tested a lot. We have done okay. transmission tests, infectivity, and so on. So it's just 1% of hundreds of samples positive to Zalela by qPCR, but then no transmission. We tested cages. We tested like big tents, so we built up macrocosmos and no transmission to olive. Oh, so it's a good news yeah. for Europe. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, it's working. Thank you, thank you for this very interesting talk. I'm, I'm just wondering, maybe I missed from your talk, sorry. I, I was wondering, 
what is the geographical coverage of the samples you, you have in your database? Ah. Uh, you have mainly specimens from France, of course, but we went also in Spain, Portugal, and uh, Italia. We have a lot from Corsica. What is missing in our database is the uh, eastern part of Europe. We have a good, co we have a good um, sampling in the western part, but not in the eastern part. You, you find no problems to, to use barcoding for those specimens that were from different locations? No, at no, all. no, for the moment, no. Okay. We have problems uh, for some species, but they are, not le they are not linked to the localization. Okay, thanks. Just one question. As uh, Philenus espumarius and Tesselatus cannot be differentiated by barcoding normal phorotically, do we know really that they are two different species? Are they genetically um, compatible or, or isolated? We don't know. We have to check uh, this. Uh, we, don't, uh, we, we have differences morphologically. They are difficult to use sometimes, but we have some. With the CO1, we have no differences, but uh, the first test with the rod sequencing are promising, and uh, it seems to, to have some differences between both species. But this is a question we will have uh, soon to decide if it is or not the, the same species. And the important point is not if it is or not, but do they have different biology and different um, comportment? With Xylella, it is that that is important. So, are there more questions? We have time for one more. No? Then thank you again, Jean Claude. <laughs> so, we go back to the question of uh, Xylella transmission. Uh, Nicola Bodino from the University of Torino present his talk, Transmission Characteristics of Xylella fastidiosa subspecies Pauca by Philenus spumarius and uh, Cigadella viridis. Right, right. Uh -huh. no, no laser point. That's, that's a pity. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I will be quite... Thanks. Yeah, better. Um, okay, so I will be uh, quite brief for an introduction. Uh, I think that everyone here knows uh, what is Xylella fastidiosa, that it is a xylem limited uh, bacterium, and therefore its vectors are xylem subfeeders insects, uh, mainly belonging to two groups, sharpshooters and spitterbugs. Bacterium and vectors, together with crops and no crop plants, so the landscape level, uh, are the main characters of Xylella fastidiosa pathosystem that are quite well, these main characters and their interaction are quite well known in uh, American agrosystems, but in case of new introduction or new discoveries, uh, like in Europe, we have different such species uh, of Xylella, different agroecosystems like olive uh, groves, and different vectors, spitterbugs, versus um, sharpshooters that uh, are the main vectors in uh, American agrosystem. So the transmission and epidemiology of uh, Xylella fastidiosa um, in Apulia and in Europe is not well known yet. What we know is that Philenus primarius is the main vector of uh, Xylella fastidiosa in Europe and uh, is um, able to efficiently uh, acquire and transmit uh, Xylella uh, on olive and is abundant um, on olive canopies and throughout the um, olive agroecosystem. Cicadella viridis is the most common um, sharpshooter in Europe and is a potential vector of Xylella fastidiosa, but is not uh, present on uh, olive canopies, uh, but could visit grapevine, that is a susceptible. Um, host for uh, some uh, subspecies of um, Xylella fastidiosa and other wild hosts, so enlarging the uh, reservoir or 
of um, wild host plant of Xylella. So the incidence, persistence, and spread of uh, Xylella are not well known. Yeah. So our aims were to um, describe some aspect of transmission biology of Xylella ST53 by Philenus pumarius with one set of experiments on transmission dynamics, so acquisition, persistence, and transmission of Xylella fastidiosa by uh, Philenus pumarius in different inoculation times and seasons. A second set of experiments was uh, a spread model, very artificial, I have to say, but a spread model of Xylella on uh, olives having as a output a proportion of insects infected and olive infected. Also, we, um, we, we carried out a set of experiments uh, to um, clarify the relationships between uh, um, Cicadella viridis and Xylella fastidiosa, so acquisition, persistence, and transmission again. The first set of experiments was then um, repeated in uh, summer and autumn in two different years with Philenus pumarius um, acquiring um, Xylella from field olives and then um, isolated on single olive plantlets. A different time post acquisition, from zero up to 72 days from acquisition. Uh, at each time, we um, used five replicas, so five uh, olive plantains, and five with five insects each. So the results show that uh, Philenus pumarius is infective and infectious immediately after the end acquisition, and is, inf and is infected for all its adult life. There is also a seasonal effect, so a higher proportion of infective insects um, at the beginning of uh, uh, the first day after um, let me go here after uh, <laughs> end of acquisition um, and also the proportion of infecting individu individuals decreases slightly during time in autumn the two plots on the right these could be related but it's just a hint of an hypothesis that uh, Philenus infectus by Xylella could show a, uh, have a shorter longevity that is linked to the discussion that we have with uh, Daniele about the um, relationships with, uh, uh, between uh, Philenus and, uh, and Xylella, that probably Philenus are not just flying syringe, uh, there is much more. Very interesting, I think. So uh, about the transmission uh, to olives that are the interesting part, uh, we, we got the transmission quite cons uh, constant during time post acquisition and among season with a range about of 30 to 60% of plants infected. No clear, I mean, we have only five replicas per time. So obviously it's uh, uh, quite difficult to find statistically significant uh, for this experiment. But for this, we have the second uh, set of experiment uh, where um, Philenus after um, acquiring um, Xylella were isolated in uh, cages uh, with 16 olive plantlets in two different conditions, outdoor and indoor. So uncontrolled and controlled condition, climatic conditions. Right? Um, for different inoculation period, so from three to 21 days of contact of the insect vector with the plants. The results show that uh, the proportion of infected plants, olives, increase slightly uh, with inoculum time although being lower than the other experiment, probably because the bigger cage, they, uh, they, they, they got more dispersed and less uh, easy to spot the, um, to spot the, the plant. Uh, but we observe also high prevalence of axillary infected plants after only three days of inoculum. Let me go here. 
is, is this exactly. Uh, so they are perfectly able to, uh, to transmit with a fairly good uh, efficiency, um, even in a short time. Um, there is also higher transmission efficiency uh, under control conditions, more in indoor than outdoor, and no differences between season. The third set of experiments involving uh, Cicadella viridis, uh, um, um, the sharpshooter uh, acquired from periwinkle and artificial diets, XFM and PD3. Um, and then uh, was able to inoculate to a single periwinkle plant for different time post acquisition. Uh, as a control, uh, we used Philenus pumarius that acquired from periwinkle and polyga. The results show a Cicadella viridis acquisition from artificial nu nutrition, both diets, the upper right plot, they uh, they got uh, up to 30, 50 percent of individuals infected, but only one insect acquired from periwinkle. The control, Philenus pumarius, instead uh, acquired easily from both periwinkle and polygala. Transmission to plants was very low uh, for um, um, Cicadella viridis, only two plants at the first. Um, uh, three days after, uh, actually two, two days after um, acquisition um, were positive um, and no transmission uh, was registered from periwinkle to periwinkle. Philenus pumarius again was uh, able to transmit with good efficiency uh, to periwinkle from both periwinkle and polygala. So in conclusion, um, Philenus pumarius can acquire and transmit Cilera fastidiosa ST53 on olives through all the year, all its adult life. And the proportion of infective olives tend to increase, even though slightly, um, with time of inoculation. So the longer the insects stay in contact with the plants, the longer, uh, the, longer <laughs> the higher is the probability that the plants get infected. It's quite obvious, obvious, but uh, I think that it's better to, to have data, quantitative data on this. Um, however, high transmission rate can occur also after three days of inoculum. So we, in a control perspective, we have to stop the adults uh, as soon or better before it can get to the olive canopies. Uh, there is uh, a no clear seasonal effect on efficiency of Oxylella fastidiosa transmission to olive. About the Cicadella viridis, uh, um, it, it acquires and transmits uh, Oxylella fastidiosa ST53 uh, from artificial diet only, and also with uh, very low efficiency, at, at least the transmission. Um, so these, together with uh, the fact, the ecological observation that is not fine on um, olive canopies um, make quite clear that there are no evidence of uh, a, a role and a future role as a vector of Xylella fastidiosa. This observation, together with the ecological observation showed you by Domenico Bosco uh, some uh, hours ago, uh, make, uh, make clear that population dynamics of the Philenus pumarius are important to understand Xylella uh, epidemics. In a control perspective, like in Apulia, Philenus pumarius is abundant on olive trees for a limited, quite, I mean, two months. It's relati relatively um, limited uh, time window. Mm. Also, a period of the year where, when uh, there is generally a lower uh, Xylella fastidiosa load into olive trees. Um, so, this limited time window make possible to um, think um, strategies to suppress Philenus pumarius adults on olive trees or make olive trees not. Uh, um, 
not good for Philenus pomarius with the insecticides or with uh, Sabina's uh, um, vibrational um, uh, methods. I mean, every, everything that can <laughs> uh, avoid the colonization, the presence of Philenus pomarius on olive canopies is good. Um, but in a risk assessment on North Italy, especially uh, to Liguria, we, we have studied that um, ag agroecosystems, olive agroecosystems, we have observed a um, presence of Philenus pomarius in a quite abundantly on uh, olive trees uh, for several months, from May to September, usually. So this is a very longer uh, time window that make uh, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to think to use uh, uh, insecticides or other methods for, uh, for such a long time. So it's even more fundamental to, uh, in, in North Italy to control the nymphal stages be before they can uh, become adults and go and colonize uh, olive uh, canopies. Thank you for your attention. I want to thank uh, um, X Factors for funding this project and all the people that collaborated uh, this, uh, in this work, uh, the CNR EPCP, uh, CRSFA uh, Locorotondo, uh, Acli Vacale. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, we have time for questions. Yes, Daniela. So you used for the acquisition Zalala growth on PD3 and XFM. Did you notice some differences in acquisition? No. Uh, no, that's my case. No, I can. No. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. The, the, the results show, um, okay, the only transmission was from PD3, two plants, and uh, for acquisition was, uh, okay, we are talking about low numbers, or, or also of insects, so it's always difficult to, to, yeah, to, to think a statistically significant difference, but uh, it seems that uh, um, PD3 uh, immediately after acquisition was higher the, um, the prevalence uh, of, uh, of xylella, of, uh, of xylella infected individuals, and, de and decreased quite rapidly. While XFM, the contrary. Uh, it, it seems that uh, about uh, seven, five to seven days was higher than PD3, XFM. Yeah, but was not. XFM uh, with addition of chitin or pectin or whatever. No. That's weird because of the yeah. the Lopez group, I think. They publish like the same job that we... So we have this fact that Zalela can be acquired after growing on a substrate with chitin or pectin or whatever. But you have showed that you have used a substrate without chitin or pectin and you got acquisition in your experiment. He has done the same. Uh, we are working on Philanus and we have the same data, so it's, it's weird. Yeah, it's, it's weird, but w this was really a preliminary um, work. Uh, before coming to some conclusion about the difference between uh, artificial diets on uh, uh, Cicadella viridis, I would really be confident with more data because now, uh, I mean, I, I presented this because it was, I think, interesting to uh, have a, a first um, hint that uh, uh, Cicadella is not a, a vector of, uh, of, of Xylella. About this difference is very interesting, but I think that really we need more data to, to, uh, before getting any conclusion. Yeah, so uh, this will require beers later, but um, it is not weird because the, the CVC strain has a truncated polygalacturonase, uh, which yours, I don't think, has, would be worth looking into. Um, my question really is, um, do you know 
if cicadella fed as much from the diet as philanus? What, what Do you know if cicadella fed as much from the diet as philanus did? F fed? Fed, ingested. M more. It feeds more from the diet. Feed more than philanus pumarius. From the diet. Uh, Philenus pumarius uh, here uh, w was not tested uh, on uh, artificial diets because the, um, the protocol um, used for sharpshooters, it doesn't, uh, um, I mean, Philenus pumarius dies, so we started only with Cicadella. Uh, during this summer, uh, we did together with uh, Daniele, uh, some experiments with a protocol designed for artificial nutrition by Philenus pumarius. So I, I, I have no idea about uh, the difference in uh, quantification of feeding by the, the two. Uh, I can try to answer the question by uh, Rodrigo. Uh, when, doing, when dealing with these uh, acquisition experiments from uh, artificial feeding, uh, apparently Cicadella viridis uh, uh, feeds better than uh, Philenus because they survive very well compared to Philenus. So I would say Cicadella viridis ingest, maybe, I don't know. In any case, uh, there is a, a much better survival of Cicadella. This is the only uh, things I can add to the to this point. Uh, okay, we should. <laughs> Any other question? And I have one last question. Uh, ah. Thank you. I, uh, you had two conclusions at the end, and uh, you said that for the North Italy situation, it's doesn't make any sense to try to kill the adults, but it makes sense to try to kill the adults for the South Italy. And I think in both cases, wouldn't it be better to try to kill the immatures before reaching the olives? Yeah, this, this was uh, not, not, not enough stress. Uh, I was not saying uh, that we should, uh, I mean, is only additional, uh, additional to the nymphs control, the adult control. Uh, we have to continue to try to lower as much as possible the nymphal population in order to have the lowest uh, possible um, abundance of adults. But since uh, we see the situation in, uh, in Apulia that we still have adults, um, even though there is a, uh, I mean, a protocol for uh, control of, um, of nymphs, we got to think also uh, strategies to deal with adults. And yeah, I was just uh, underlining that uh, in South Italy seems more possible to uh, be um, feasible, uh, a control of, a effective control of adults. While in a situation like in North Italy with a, such a long time window of visiting uh, adults, of Philenus pumarius on olive canopies, it makes really less sense. It's not impossible, but could be too costly and not effective. Okay, I think we should go on. Thank you again. The next speaker is Clara Lago from the Institute of Sustainable Agriculture. <laughs> Clara Lago will speak about the flight behavior of Philenus pumarius the main vector of Xylella fastidiosa. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm going to talk about the flight behavior of Philenus spumarius, but also about uh, other potential vectors movement. No? How it works? Uh, well, uh, Philenus spumarius, but also Neophilenus pampestris and Philenus italosignus have been identified as uh, vectors of Silella fastidiosa here in Europe. 
uh, vectors movement have profound implication in the spread of vector bone diseases. So knowledge on this matter is critical in order to uh, assess the risk of plant disease epidemics. Atoms of spittle bus are able to intentionally displace by jumping, crawling, or flying. In 1954, uh, Weber and King described that uh, adults of Philenus spumarius were able to travel 30 meters in a single flight and 100 meters in 24 hours. Other studies with captures in altitude showed that uh, adults of spittle bus were able to uh, displace from 15 to uh, 200 meters in altitude. Due to this vertical displacement, they may passively travel long distances but laminar air currents. Adults of spittlebacks spend most of the time feeding on the grasses in the groves where they live. Uh, then in summer, they tend to migrate uh, to other slater habitats in order to feed on woody hosts. Then in autumn, they, they return back to the crops after the first rains when the ground vegetation regrowth in order to lay the eggs. Uh, it is true that uh, uh, such hosts such as uh, olive trees or almond trees only act as trusting hosts uh, for these spittlebacks. However, it is thought that Neophilenus campestris and Philenus spumarius may play a key role in the Silella uh, fastidiosa transmission when they migrate uh, to uh, these habitats uh, during the summer or then in autumn when they return to the crops. So how long can they travel? Uh, which is their flight potential? Or where do they go during the summer? All these questions need to be answered. It is true that studying insect movement can be challenging. However, uh, combining techniques such as rotational flight mills in the laboratory or uh, performing a um, um, field assays using mass marine capture techniques can improve our knowledge on movement of Silella fastidiosa vectors. So the objectives of our study was to, were to study the flight potential of Philenus spumarius and to study the patterns of directional movement of potential vectors in the field. So what uh, we did first, uh, we performed a flight mill assay using Philenus spumarius. We first uh, glue the filenus uh, by the pronotus to the head of a pin using a small drop of adre uh, adhesive. Then we connected it to the flight mill uh, with, and it is started to fly describing a circular trajectory. Uh, the mill recording device was used in order to record all the flight descriptors which are the flight incidence, if they are able to fly or not, the flight duration, the distance that they travel, and the mean velocity. If an individual didn't, uh, didn't fly after a 15 minutes lag, uh, it was discarded uh, and changed it. As independent variables, we studied how the sex and the season of the year impact uh, the, um, the flight behavior of Philenus spumarius. And we defined three different seasons, which were uh, spring, early summer, and late summer. And what we saw was that uh, nearly the 60% of the individuals were able to fly. Then the mean distance travel was a uh, 485 meters with a maximum distance travel of 5.47 uh, kilometers. Uh, the mean flight duration was about 30 minutes with a maximum of 5.49 hours. And uh, the mean speed was a uh, uh, 0.24 meters per second with a maximum of 0.49 meters per second. Uh, we also uh, saw that uh, regarding flight incidents with a uh, logistic regression that the uh, sex and the period of the year significantly impact the flight incidents, which is lower in males and higher during the late summer. Well, here in this graph, what we see is the distance that they are able to travel between the, uh, both sex, which are females and males, and uh, in the three different periods of the year, spring, early summer, and late summer. And what we saw was that uh, the distance travel was significantly lower in males and also significantly lower during the early summer. Regarding flight duration, we also observed that it is uh, significantly lower in males and significantly lower during the early summer. 
And for the mean speed, uh, we saw that uh, it is significantly lower in males than in females. We also conducted an experiment on the field that was a mass mark recapture assay with Neophilenus campestris. And as marker, we used uh, fluorescent dust. Uh, previously, we conducted an assay to study the dust prevalence on the body of the insect, uh, its effect on the mortality rate, and its effect on the flight behavior using a flight meal as described it before. The experiment took place in Santos de la Homosa in Madrid, Spain. We first captured the insects by swept net. Uh, the most abundant uh, Cercopida insect species was Neophilenus campestris, so we decided to perform uh, the mass mass recapture assay with this, uh, with this species. Then we marked them with four different fluorescent colors, which were orange, uh, yellow, blue, and pink. Just after marking, we released the insects at four different sampling points, one uh, per color. Uh, the sampling points uh, were um, olive, olive groves uh, covered with brown vegetation. And the distances between the release points were 180 meters, 133 meters, and 49 meters. The capture and the marking uh, were performed the 23rd of May in 2009, and the recaptures took place from uh, 20 to 45 days after the individuals were released. Uh, the, it, they took place at 12 different sampling points uh, that were at a distance from the release point from a minimum of 95 meters and a maximum of 200, um, sorry, 2,462 meters. And uh, in these recapture points, there were pine trees, kerkus trees, uh, and among other kind of vegetation. When we recaptured the insects, we uh, brought them back to the laboratory and exposed them to ultraviolet light uh, to identify if they were marked or not. So firstly, uh, with the flight meal assay, with market uh, Neophilenus campestris, what, what we saw was, firstly, there were no significant differences between the market individuals and the unmarked individuals, so the dust doesn't affect the flight behavior. And we also saw that they, uh, the mean distance travel was uh, 281 meters. Uh, the average flight duration was about 60 minutes uh, with a mean velocity of 0 0.27 meters per second with a maximum distance travel of 1.3 kilometers, uh, a maximum flight duration of one hour and 30 minutes, and uh, the, mean uh, the maximum mean velocity was 0 0.42 meters per second. We also observed that the individuals remained dusted for 45 days and that the marking doesn't affect the mortality rate. We only captured the Neophilenus campestris in uh, Pinus pinea and Pinus alipensis trees. We captured uh, 21 uh, market individuals uh, out of uh, 1,315 individuals that were released, which represent a 1.6%. Uh, we recaptured the individuals at three different uh, recapture points. First, we captured eight individuals at a distance of 123 meters uh, to, from 20 to 35 days after they were released. Uh, we captured other eight individuals at a distance of 281 meters uh, distance from when, where they released uh, 45 days after the release. And finally, we found five individuals uh, at a distance from 2.2 kilometers to 2.4 kilometers uh, 35 days after they were released. So to sum up, in the flight meal assay with uh, Philenus spumarius, we observed that the flight potential was higher than was thought, that the females were greater flyer than males, that the flight potential decreases during the early summer when they are in summer's later habitats, that, and that the flight incidence is higher during the uh, during the late summer when they return uh, to the crops in order to lay the eggs. In the mass mass recapture assay with Neophilenus campestris, well, with market individuals in the flight meal assay with Neophilenus campestris, we also observed that the flight potential was higher than was thought. 
We observed that Neophinellus campestris moved to pine trees uh, during the early summer. And finally, that they were able to travel much more than was thought, almost 2.4 kilometers in 35 days. Finally, I want to say thanks to uh, all my colleagues from the UV, uh, IUPP Research Group and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Um, according to the, uh, to the program, there is no question uh, okay. section now, but please keep your questions for the final uh, discussion. Uh, then for the last two talks, you can ask uh, questions. And uh, so I would like to invite Anna Markheiser from JKI in Germany for the last talk, post-plant affiliation of xylem feeders within Central Europe. Um, okay, I um, hope I can keep up your interest for rectors uh, for another 10 minutes despite the late hour to give you some news on host plant affiliation of potential rectors of Xylella fastidiosa. Um, Xylella fastidiosa was detected in Germany for the first time in 2016 and it was identified as the subspecies fastidiosa with poses a risk for the local viticulture. So um, this is a typical uh, situation in German wine growing regions. Um, the vineyards are normally interrupted by smaller orchards or, or alleys such as almonds and cherries. And besides, um, these um, vineyards are often smaller forest areas. And in order to identify the candidate vectors for Germany, we um, performed a survey by collecting the insects with the sweep net from the crown cover and the canopy of trees and vines. <coughs> um, to show you, uh, you can see the number of collected individuals over the season in these three habitat types. And you see that um, the identified vector, Philenus gomarius, in red, is present from the end of May until the beginning of October. And um, in where we um, listed the six most common species uh, found in German wine growing regions, uh, although we identified 14 potential vector species. But these six are the most common. These are the three spittlebug species, Philenus bumarius, as well as Neophilenus campestris. Then the third one is uh, the elder spittlebug, Afrofuralni, um, one frockhopper species, Cecopis vulnerata, and two sharpshooter species, Cigadella viridis and Evacanthus interruptus. Um, all these um, species were present within the habitat and the crown cover. And uh, what we find in the tree canopy um, is also Philenus bomarius, besides um, Afrofora alni. Afrofora alni is a species which is normally found in these smaller forest areas and is uh, in particular um, more yeah, abundant than Philenus bomarius. And we can also find these adults in orchards. We uh, performed a survey in different vineyards, which were all rejected to um, forest borders. And in all of these vineyards, we find Philenus pomarius. Um, we don't find any individuals uh, of Afrofaralni of in the crown cover uh, within the vineyard. Nevertheless, um, we find some individuals um, in the canopy of vine which means they emigrated from the attractive forest borders to the vineyard. But how is the situation in these smaller Brunus orchards? We performed a survey in a sherry orchard and an almond orchard and in a mixed Brunus orchards with sherry and plums. All of these host plants can be infected with the bacterium. And we find in all these orchards Philenus bumarius, as well as Neophilenus campestris, both competent vectors to um, transmit Xylella fastidiosa, at least ST53. 
and um, in some orchards we even find a higher population density of Cigadella viridis than for Phelenus gomarius. Uh, Cigadella viridis is the only species which performs two generations per year, which means um, they will lose their infectivity um, during the summer period. And in the crown cover we see of these orchards as well um, in red, Philenus pomarius and Cray of Prophora alni, um, besides some individuals of um, Cigadella viridis, um, Neophilenus campestris. Cigadella viridis is normally a species restricted to the crown cover, um, but we assume that due to the high population density in some plots, um, it poses beside Neophilenus campestris, um, Philenus pomarius, and Afrofra Ani, the highest risk for potential spread of Xylella fastidiosa. But we don't know if this species accept, um, for example, cherry, almond, and grape wine for feeding, but well, because we normally find them in the ground cover. Um, to analyze this behavior, we um, collected insects in the field, placed them under control conditions on um, potted plants, four to six months old, and check the survival probability on these, of these insects on the different plant species over a period of six weeks. And we see that in red, and as Philenus fumarius, and in blue, Neophilenus campestris, um, is that they are, both species are equally able to survive on left L cherry, on the middle almond, and uh, the third one on grapevine. And after a period of six weeks, um, more than 50% of the individuals are still alive on this plant. So, but how about the sharp species, Cigadella viridis? This species is less able to survive on these um, cherry plants than Neophilenus campestris and um, Philenus barmarius, but in of the same extent able to survive on grapevine plants. Afrofora alni and cray is the only species which was not able to survive under controlled conditions. We assume that this species is rather uh, feeding on the woody part and that our plants were too young to, to feed on. This is what we observed in the laboratory. So um, future, um, yeah surveys or experiments regarding to check this are unnecessary. In order to uh, estimate the, the role from uh, potential acquisition of the bacterium from this plant, we analyzed the feeding behavior of this species on the specific host plants. So we did this with the electric, electrical penetration graph. I'm happy uh, I don't have to explain the details. This is what Daniela already did. <laughs> and uh, he already identified six waveform types for the vector Neophilenus uh, bomarius, which are related to specific feeding characteristics. And with this knowledge, uh, we performed together with the CSIC in Madrid, with Alberto Ferreras Group and Daniela Conara, um, experiments to analyze the host plant preference of Helenus pomarius um, and the xylem ingestion activity on different plants and observed that Helenus pomarius is able to, or is the xylem ingestion is higher in cherry and grape, for example, than in rosemary and oleander. Uh, but nevertheless, the, all the species are settled at least temporarily at this plant and are able from the experiments of Daniela, we know that they are able to transmit the bacterium even to oleander. So we observed similar waveform patterns for the other species and um, that the EPG recording with the other species and analyzed the feeding activity on these three plants. Um, Philenus bomarius um, here on almond. And you see the propor proportion of um, time of the single waveform pat patterns, how long they performed the single waveform 
patterns over a period of six weeks. And three waveforms, Daniela told or explained it already, are related to activities of the stylet within the xylem vessel. These are the waveforms XE for xylem ingestion M for enough pathway interruption during xylem feeding and the resting activities within the xylem vessel. In dark gray, you see uh, xylem ingestion activity, the proportion of xylem ingestion, and you see that all these three species are able to ingest uh, xylem sap from almond as well as from the other two plants. What we see is uh, differences in their duration and um, frequency. These are all um, the preliminary results and uh, further research is necessary in order to implement the new um, results of identification of waveform patterns which are related to um, ingestion of the bacterium um, to identify the risk for these plant species. But nevertheless, all species can feed from the xylem and all um, of these plants are possibly endangered. So to conclude, uh, we identified four potential vector species for German wine growing regions, um, which could be relevant for Xylella fastidiosa spread within Germany. We, uh, out of 14 identified potential vector species, nine were found in orchards and seven in vineyards. Some of the species are really rare, but uh, for example, Crawford cephala which is a sharpshooter and really common in gardens and parks, um, can switch to ejected orchards and possibly um, re be responsible for primary spread of the bacterium or can, yeah, deliver an oculum within the orchard for other species to spread the bacterium. Um, Tigata leveridis is in contrast uh, to Afrofrooani associated to the ground cover. Nevertheless, you um, it's possible that the, the species can acquire the bacterium because we confirmed the xylem ingestion activity of the species, but we assume that it may rather act as a potential vector for suckers and seedlings due to this restricted uh, abundance to the crown cover. Last but not least, I would like uh, to thank my colleagues from JKI, uh, thank the colleagues from CSIC in Spain for their support in EPG studies, then as well for the financial support um, with XF actors and you for your attention. Thank you, Anna. And I would like to invite all speakers to the final discussion. So, of course, we have a, a general discussion now, but uh, don't forget that uh, if you have uh, questions uh, specifically, specifically to the talks of uh, Clara Lago and Anna Markheiser, you are invited to ask uh, now. So, there, obviously, there are no specific questions to your talks. We had very interesting presentations on different uh, works related to more or less practical aspects of the monitoring and control of Xylella fastidiosa vectors. And uh, yeah, do you have uh, any questions, remarks uh, related to this topic? Yeah, Nico. Yeah, it's, it's just a, maybe a curiosity for uh, Clara. Uh, in regards to the colors you were using, uh, do you think uh, those colors may have any, any impact on the predation in terms of, let's say, some of the insects were more easily to be spotted than others? 
considering that uh, oh, Neophilenus and Philenus, they are developing descriptive colors uh, as, as much as possible. Not probably, maybe not in, in green pine trees, but uh, in most of the vegetation. Well, um, I think maybe it has some effects on the predation. However, <clears throat> uh, the, the marking color, uh, it remains for, for, short, for, for short time, but uh, it tends to lose it because it is started to clean and when it is raining, it uh, tends to lose it. And uh, we uh, mainly recognize uh, the marking color using the uh, ultraviolet light, not uh, just by na naked eye. So it may be have some effects, but fortunately it is not going to be like a lot of time that are show color just so, at the first time. So when, when you recover the insects, they are not like in the picture you, you show. <laughs> yes, it's ja this is just after marking, but yeah, they yeah. started to lose okay. the color. Uh, and Finally, you are only able to detect it uh, using the ultraviolet light. Right, yeah, thanks. There's another question there. Well, it's also a question for Clara Lago. M maybe I missed something in your talk. So as far as I understand, you recollected your marked insect in three different locations, right? Uh, no, uh, we tried to recollect them at 12 different sampling points, but we only uh, found uh, marked insects at three different uh, points. But you had, you had more sampling points, right? Yes, 12 different sampling points. A question to Jean-Claude uh, about the barcode. Uh, are you looking at the variation among populations of uh, the spirobug, the sp uh, spumarius, uh, from different locations to see whether, or is the marker uh, adequate for that too, uh, for looking at this intraspecific variation? The marker is not really adequate. And for spumarius, we have some specimens from Belgium to Morocco. They are exactly the same barcode. Uh, to do that, we will need more variable marker. And especially, we have no differences between the Corsica population and the mainland French population that have not the same habits. It's not possible to, to see any differences by, by this marker. Okay, this is a question to Clara, but possibly also to Daniele and Nicola. Possibly it's a crazy question, but do you think that uh, infected insects could change the uh, fly activity, the fly behavior, the fly capability due to the infection of the vector of the bacteria? Well, I, I don't really know, but uh, it is something interesting to study. Maybe in the future we can try to uh, conduct other flight mill assays uh, using infected individuals. Uh, nice. <laughs> Maybe some people here is going to kill me later. But yeah, it's, it's possible. It's what we found as an effect on feeding behavior. What we can observe in field is that, so when you have um, philanos that survive during the winter and you go and collect them and you test by QPCR, it's just that you find just negative philanos. So it's like positive philanos, you are not able to find them during the winter. So the only surviving one are the negative one, but so a lot of work about this should be performed to see if there is or not an effect and which kind of effect. So maybe something interesting. Okay. I have uh, a question also related to this topic. Uh, Amandine, you showed that um, uh, infectious or at least a positive uh, Philenus spumarius were present in Corsica all over winter. Uh, I think it was March, February or March. Uh, though, do you think this has any implications on the epidem epidemiology of the disease? So maybe the Italian colleagues can also call, uh, uh, have an idea about this? 
Okay, so I'm not an entomologist. So yes, the fact is that uh, some uh, Philanspermarius were collected in uh, different months from uh, October and from and until March, and we found uh, positive uh, in each uh, collected month. Mm -hmm. So, but about the epidemiology, maybe you'll be more able to answer. Or <laughs> is that? The first year that Zalala was discovered in, in Italy, so we, we sampled Philanus October, November, we found positive. Then we continued sampling and we found just negative Philanus during the, so the one surviving the winter, testing them, nothing, just negative Philanus. I don't know which kind of impact they can have during winter. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the effect of temperature on the transmission. It's it's something we, we really don't know. We, we, don't, we just know a spot of the story, that is what happened when Philanos go to Olive, and then Olive, Olive, and then we don't know. It's, mm. it's we don't know what happened outside, we don't know what happened to other hosts, and so on. Okay, are there more questions? Yep. Yes, this is a question for Clara. Uh, you say that uh, you, t you do the trials in 12 points to recapture the adults. So which was the longest distance that you checked? Uh, the longest distance was uh, the point of uh, 2.4 kilometers. So in, in the longest point you found adults? Yes, we found five uh, market individuals. And uh, so maybe they go further? Maybe they go further. Uh, we. Uh, Observe in the area uh, like uh, three kilometers a uh, perimeter, which there were fields in. We thought that they could be, and maybe they can go farther. We don't know. And uh, second question is: How many individuals did you check uh, under the black light in the lab? Uh, repeat, please. How many individuals did you check under the black light and the ultraviolet light? In the uh, lab to know if they are uh, with fluorescein or not. Okay, uh, we may. Uh, I I don't know the exact number, but I think that uh, 500 individuals uh, we tested, but we only find at least 21 individuals market. But I'm not sure of the exact number. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions. Uh, may I make a yeah. question to Clara? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but um, for the marker release, mm -hmm. um, you released them in a single point? Uh, no. Well, uh, and how, how, do you, uh, how did you choose that point? Well, because in that area we found, well, the landscape was a uh, really heterogeneous. <laughs> So uh, we found uh, four uh, different uh, crops, olive crops, with uh, covered with brown vegetation. So we decided to, uh, and that they were close to each other. Uh, so we decided uh, these four different points because were the most suitable habitats for the, um, the Neophilinus campestris and was the place where we found uh, more of them. I have a question for Anna. Um, in your surveys of, uh, of mosquito bugs and sharpshooters on the vineyards or and also in the other plants, do you observe the position? I mean, the part of the plants that the, these different species are, are feeding or are located when you sample them? Um, so in, in vineyards, it's really uh, difficult to find them in, in, in the canopy, so we can't exactly um, give details on the settled um, tissue, but uh, from the lab we have um, yeah ideas that the um, Cicadella viridis is more restricted to an on grapevine, for example, on the main stem, and Neophilianus campestris is to to my observation uh, more restricted to the leaf stem, so. Yeah, but I don't know if they prefer uh, younger or older tissues. This is uh, could maybe important uh, because uh, if 
depending on the place they feed, uh, they may be, uh, there may be a higher potential for them to acquire Cereal fastidiosa. But it's, it's important to, to keep this type oh, of information me. to evaluate the propensity. Okay, I think we should uh, finish the discussion here. Oh, did I disturb your question? No. We, we should finish here. It is uh, 6.30. I would like to thank all the uh, speakers and you as an audience for the patience too. Just the te uh, no. Just the te technical information for those uh, colleagues that attend the work package meeting tomorrow. We meet at the. Uh, we will meet at the room Fred Samaroni. That is in the second floor at 8:30. <laughs>